Welcome to it everybody, this is Excel Live. My name is Lama Moon and today I've got something very exciting for you. We are at the South African Astronomical Observatory where they're going to be showing us the telescopes that they use to check out what's happening in the sky. But before the telescopes is back on, we're going to visit him later on as a small in my workshop. We're going to visit him later on as a small in my workshop. Why he does the job that he does and what's the Satisfaction he has when he does the job that he does. Well, taking us around today is going to be Dr. Daniel, who is an engagement science astronomer. So come along with me and have some fun. Welcome to SciTech Wednesday. Finding accurate positions for the southern stars and the planets was one of the primary reasons for setting up the Royal Observatory. This task was completely dependent on knowing the exact time. The position of an object in the sky is defined by two numbers similar to longitude and latitude on the Earth called right ascension and declension. Welcome to it everybody, we are at the South African Astronomical Observatory, right here we had Kota Zazo Ezilapa Observatory, well if Oya Zipilenda will just take a taxi, taxi vibes, to the left if you're coming from the Cape Town to the right if wherever. Well, standing next to me is science engagement astronomer with Dr. Daniel, who's going to be showing us around and telling us about Gonzwandulina Apa. But first things first, we saw you opening um, up. What do we call this place? So this is the McLean Telescope. McLean Telescope. Why do we open those? I, we know why we open them because we wanted light. We can't film <laughs> in, in dark. But on a regular day, why would you open that? So we wouldn't normally open it in the daytime. Mm. We would only be opening it in the evening so that we can see the stars. And as we saw, there are two shutters to open and the whole roof can spin around mm. so we can look anywhere in the sky with our telescope. What are you looking for? Uh, so as astronomers, we look at all sorts of things. So we look at stars, uh, planets around other stars, mm. uh, and then also other galaxies. So uh, other collections of stars uh, in very distant galaxies. What's your day-to-day -day looking like? What do you guys do? So as astronomers, uh, our day-to-day -day is mostly analyzing the data which was taken at night. Uh, all of the telescopes we operate here at the observatory are based up in Sutherland, mm -hmm. uh, about four hours drive from Cape Town. Uh, and the, the telescopes that operate there are operated by either an astronomer who uh, sits at that telescope overnight or remotely. Mm -hmm. So somebody anywhere else in the world, sometimes here in Cape Town, sometimes in any other country anywhere. Okay. And, and so, so then those observations are taken at night, mm. the data is collected, uh, and the astronomers will then spend their day uh, reducing that data and trying to figure out what, what they saw. You spoke about Sutherland, but I believe that once upon a time, what they do there was once done here. So why was it moved to Sutherland? Yeah, so the observatory here in Cape Town uh, was established in 1820, mm. so almost 200 years ago. Uh, and for a very long time after that, all of the astronomy was done from here. Uh, in the early 70s, 1972, we established the Sutherland Observatory. Uh, and basically the reason for that was the light pollution from all of the people in Cape Town was becoming so great that in order to do cutting edge astronomy, mm. we had to get somewhere darker, uh, somewhere away from the city lights uh, and with sort of better, better observing. This telescope itself was, was uh, built in 1896. Yeah. Uh, the telescope was installed in 1900. And at the time, this was one of the biggest telescopes in the world for then. Um, it was uh, funded by a donor, mm. um, so no expense was spared in making it a, a really world-class telescope at the time. And uh, as we saw earlier, the dome can rotate mm. and open, uh, and the telescope can point anywhere in the sky. Sure. But, but when you do that, the um, the telescope, the eyepiece, where you're looking, moves up and down. So you're either going to have to climb a ladder all night to mm -hmm. keep looking, or you need to build some mechanism so that you can, you can sit comfortably in a chair yeah. and observe. So what they decided to do was they made the whole floor come up and down. Sure. So you can, you can always be comfortably sitting in your chair looking through the telescope. What's, the, um, what's your current assignment? What are you looking for? What, what's your research um, entails right now, today? 
So at the observatory, we have a, a range of projects which, which our astronomers work on. Um, we work on uh, exoplanet and planetary science, so mm -hmm. looking at planets in our solar system, asteroids, uh, other sort of rocky bodies just around our sun. Uh, also then planets around other stars, which are called exoplanets. Uh, we have a large galactic astronomy uh, um, group, and they are basically doing uh, science on other galaxies. So looking at, at all the other galaxies, what they're made of, how they're formed, and how they're evolving. Uh, and then also we have a large stellar astronomy group, which is looking at other stars within our own galaxy and different shapes and sizes. And okay. If you just joined us on the Saturday, I know Dr. Daniel is telling me about the observatory astronomical Babens and Donina. So don't go too far. X is going to return. And when we come back, he's showing me around and see the fascinating job that they do right here. Keep it locked right here on Channel 263. Well, the astronomy um, is one of the oldest sciences that we've got here in the world. And the astronomy up in South Africa is science. And you are way back when, um, go 1820, when they opened doors, Greek Cape of Good Hope World. And I'm trying to we are, well, we are fortunate enough yeah. to have with Dr. Itumilang Moch. How, how do you pronounce this? Monique. Like the Monique. Yes. <laughs> and no, Dr. Skelton. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Thank you so for much. joining Thank us. You so much. I'm privileged to have you both here with us today. Um, let's jump into the first question, eh? Sure. Um, so what kind of reactions do you do do you get when people tell you that you are an astronomer? Because I would be like, well, that's amazing, that's me. I love this. What would you what did you say? <laughs> um, well, you get different reactions. So yeah. it's one of two, I think, with me. It's either, wow, uh, that's amazing, you're an astronomer, mm. you know? Tell us more. Yeah. Or what the hell is that? <laughs> you kind of have to explain it. Do you get the, the reaction saying like, oh, you, your head is stuck up in the clouds? Do you yeah. get that a lot? <laughs> <laughs> he touched on what the hell is that? So let's break it down. What the hell is an astronomer? Well, as astronomers, uh, we, we study all sorts of things you know, out in the universe. And mm. um, so there's a very wide range of things that we look at. Mm. Um, our main job is to do research, but we also run the telescopes um, that allow other astronomers around the world to do research. So, What are the myths that um, you hear about astronomy? Um, there's quite a few, but I think the most common one is um, how astronomy and astrology, how people think that that's the same thing. Mm. Ah. So um, astronomy is a science mm -hmm. where we study, we use telescopes sure. to study you know, objects in the universe, like planets and galaxies and stars. Um, so we collect data and analyze it and make mm. sense of it. Mm. Whereas astrology is um, using positions of these celestial objects to find like a connection between them and hum the, you know, things that happen on Earth. Mm. You know? So not in any way are they related? No, not at not all. Not at all? No. You learn so something new <laughs> every day. Yes, especially you and <laughs> um, Dr. Munichin, let me ask you this. Eh? Um, you study uh, the... Um, you study the, the multi-wavelength, eh? Can you speak more about that, please? Um, well, multi-wavelength just basically means that using different telescopes working in different frequencies or wavelengths to um, analyze, you know, well, I study stars, so to analyze stars. Oh. Um, so what happens is that you have different types of radiation. So for example, you have optical um, radiation. So this is radiation that op uh, operates in the optical wavelength the wavelength that you and I can, our eyes can see. Mm -hmm. But then you also have radio, you have um, x-ray, you have gamma rays, and you have infrared. Mm -hmm. And when you put this all together, it's called multi-wavelength um, astronomy. Doesn't it like bounce with, off each other? Um, not really, you just get in, um, extra information uh -huh. at different wavelengths. So something that you can see um, in the optical, oh. um, you don't necessarily see in the radio which you don't necessarily see in the X-ray and the gamma ray. So putting this picture together, you get the full picture of what's going on. So just like all the systems that is here in studio now, that's all the, the volumes and the links that's, that's happening right now. We just can't see them, yeah, but they're there. Yeah, we just can see them. If you, if you had an instrument that could detect, say, radio waves, then yeah. you would see maybe radio emission. Speaking of getting the full picture, Dr. Skelton, at what stage in your life did you decide that I want to study astrology and excel in it? What made you decide that this is what I'm going to do for life? I think I was always interested. So even in high school, I remember doing a project on galaxies and being fascinated and mm. uh, trying to find out more about it as a career. 
but I didn't really decide until uh, I was already studying physics and I knew I wanted to do some kind of science, um, but I was interested in a lot of different things. So mm. I think it took up until probably my honors year, uh, my fourth year university for me to decide I actually really want to push myself and, and go for masters and PhD in astronomy. Yeah, something totally unrelated to, do, to this interview. Um, do we have aliens out there? <laughs> Have you seen them using your telescope? I wouldn't say no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but you uh, wouldn't say yes either. <laughs> yeah. There are many, many, many planets, uh, you know, in other solar systems in our galaxy. Yeah. So yeah. It, they you could well be know. out there, but sure. we're not going to find them very easily. Sure. And Dr. Skeleton, you are working on the largest telescope um, at this moment. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, I work for SALT, which is the Southern African Large Telescope. Mm -hmm. um, it's the biggest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and it's located here in the Karoo in South Africa. So um, it's a, a very impressive facility um, that allows us to study very distant objects um, as well as things like other planets in a lot of detail. Um, so it's a big international collaboration that runs the telescope, but we operate it here from the observatory. I like that. I like telescopes. Do you like them? I love them so much. <laughs> what does one have to have, like, mentally, physically, uh, holistically to become an astronomer. Mm. What kind of a person should I be? I don't know about holistically. But mm? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess um, one of the personality traits that you need to have is patience. Yeah. Um, it takes a while, you know, to get a PhD. Uh, so it's like, I don't know, Probably 10 years ten in years. total. What? Yes. Of and university. All studying together. Yeah. Whoa. I thought it was like my, uh, maximum seven, you know? No? I mean, it, it can take seven, but it usually takes longer than that. Yeah. Um, oh, not, not just for that, though, just also for even when you do get your PhD and you're you know, actively participating in research, um, sometimes it takes a long time to get a result mm. you know, for one project, so you have to keep going. Um, so you have to have patience and resilience, because sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to. So speaking about keep going, oh mm. sorry, no, no, you might I was just going to say you have yes. to be quite self-motivated, because, yeah, as it just said, the results don't come easily, and you have to drive it yourself and yeah. be interested and curious. Yeah, keep your mic closer. Okay. The so most fulfilling part of um, working in your field, what is it? Why do you wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to work and I'm going to slay today? There are many things about astronomy that I love. Um, just in terms of my day-to-day -day job, I love the variety of it. Um, so I get to do research uh, and learn about the mysteries of the universe, which I think many people can't say they do every day. Mm. Um, but I also get to teach, uh, to supervise students, um, to participate in things like this. So quite a, <laughs> yes. a wide variety of things, which I really enjoy. Um, do you still go through math and science, um, like physical science, throughout the course of your honours and your PhD? Do you go in depth, more in depth? Um. Yeah, I mean, um, those are the tools that we use, you know, to, to yeah. try to understand what, to what we yeah. see, you know. Like maths and physics, you yeah. still use a lot of maths and physics to, to analyze the data, to write difficult? codes. Um, it does. Yeah, it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the fun, to That's solve the, the problems. Yeah. 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 How is it working at the SAAO? Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. So it's a very nice um, environment there. Mm. Um, as Dr. Ross said, mm. it's a very versatile field, astronomy. So you, know, you have people who work on planets and uh, galaxies, stars, mm. and other fields. But also at SAO, we, have, we work hand in hand with engineers so mm. who mm. design the instruments that we use. So it's a nice, it's a nice environment, and people are always smiling. Security walks, you walk in, and I like it. Greet you with a smile. <laughs> Any messages for aspiring astronomers? I think there are a lot of opportunities in South Africa to do astronomy. There are some fantastic new facilities that are being built, and then we have access to salt. Um, so mm. I think people should just go for it if they're really interested. They don't let anything hold them back. There are opportunities. Do we have enough representation of women um, in this field? Astronomy is actually one of the better uh, out of the physical sciences. I think there's a fairly good balance and quite a few senior women in astronomy. Um, it's, it's probably still not 50-50, but it's not too bad. Sure. Okay. Before we go, can we just um, have your details just before we go to reach out to you? Um, my Twitter handle, I think, is um, <laughs> at I am Matuba, yes. so I-A-M-M-A-T-U-B-A. 
and um, my Facebook is Dr. Rose. My Twitter handle is skelly underscore rose um, and just Rose Skelton on Facebook. So. What do you tweet about? Why yeah. should we follow you? <laughs> <laughs> what do I find on your timeline? Cool discoveries in astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much exactly. for coming Thank through. So I much. wish we had so much time to spend with you mm. because we are not done talking. Not done. Do you promise to come back when we call you back? Sure. We sure, deserve yeah. a whole hour yes. with you. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, Dr. Yeah. Itu and Dr. Ross joining us right here on next year. Otherwise, let's find out more what happens in their office. I had the opportunity to go to the workshop and see what happens see there when they build. <laughs> check it those. out, guys. Yeah, check it out. Welcome to it, everybody. You're still watching XA, the biggest, the baddest, and the most even happening show in town. We are at the South African Astronomical Observatory with Dr. Daniel. He's busy taking me around. We're going to see how science works when we're here. Dr. Daniel, please join me. So this is your workshop. What happens here? So obviously when you're building telescopes, uh, you can't go buy the pieces from take a lot or anything. Um, <laughs> we have to make everything ourselves. Yeah. So all of the instruments have to be made by very advanced machinery. We have to make them very, very precisely. Uh, and that's where, this is where we do that. So we make a lot of those parts and then repair parts and things as we need. Who are you making these parts for? Is it going all over the country or are you being selfish and keeping them for yourselves? No, so um, a lot of the parts are for ourselves, for our telescopes, but we actually do a lot of work for the Radio Astronomy Observatory, so we built a lot of the parts for Meerkat, yeah. um, and then we also build a lot of the parts for Atemba Labs, which is the particle collider in uh, Somerset West. Okay. So all of those are National Research Foundation facilities, and we are basically uh, running the workshop for the National Research Foundation. Okay. Can you tell me which part is what? What is he doing? I have no idea what he's doing. We're going to have to ask him what he's doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, currently, I'm busy setting up uh, for a part for the Labs. Um, it's a Vescanite part, basically that. I'm busy making a few nuts here. This is a M45 by 1.5 pitch thread, so we'll make the nuts to suit that. Um, and this goes on to a vacuum chamber. Uh, basically that we've made earlier. That part, there's a, a number of them, so that's the next one being machined right now. In terms of these machines though, I mean, these are very advanced, uh, very expensive machines. Um, can you tell us a little bit about them? Like, these two are CNC milling machines, um, the Kitamura over here, the Japanese uh, machine and then the VF8, an American made machine. Um, both of them have five axis capabilities, five axis simultaneous, so you'd be able to do complex uh, machining processes on them. Um, that one just has a bigger payload. This one is a bit more accurate though, where that one has a repeatability of 5 microns, this one has a repeatability of 2 microns, um, and it's a lot faster, where on that machine you have rapid movements of 15 meters a minute, uh, 15 meters a minute. this one would have 50 meters a minute, so your part would be able to be off this machine much faster than on that machine. Horses for courses, not saying that this one is better than that one, they both have their limitations, they both have their purpose in this workshop, so uh, this is why we have both of them. What's the most exciting part about being at this workshop and doing what you do? Yesterday, that thing was a piece of useless copper. Today it's an active part um, that would go into, go into a workspace and be useful to someone. You, you had to make that, it didn't come from anywhere. Um, the same with our instruments we built for our in-house telescopes. Yesterday there was nothing, today we have a spectrograph or we have uh, a new clamp or mount for something new. It's the challenges that comes with it. I've been here 15 years and still I get pushed every now and then with a job that comes up that challenges you. It's not mundane, it's not the same, it's, it's different. Uh, and that keeps us going, that keeps the, the, the brain thinking and that keeps us going. Mm -hmm.